thing there, or because of the millions of other because of yeah, yep. whatever those things. No one. Are. It's fine. What were? I need to go back to one of my organizational slides here, but we can do that just fine. There's different ways you can assess that question. You can say, well, are our individual genes similar to one another? Yes, they are across most of the genome. Vast swaths of the genome, we find DNA sequences between these two species that are basically almost identical to each other. And that issue is just addressed, the redundancy issue is just saying yes, and it could have been different if they were individually created with no ancestry. The Sintini argument just says, okay, we have all the same genes, are they in the same spatial orientation one to another? If these two species are just descendant versions of an original species, you would expect for the most part that the gene order would still be the same when we compare these two species now. And that's also what we see when we look at the genome. Is that, is that covering it? Okay. Go on. <laughs> Fair enough. I know. You're getting a crash course in uh, comparative genomics here. I, I did take bio lab in three times. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you're you're you you're, it that much? you're well. Yeah. <laughs> no. I've taken it several times too. So. Okay. So our genes are almost identical. They're in the same spatial orientation. The one main conundrum, the one main difference that we see is still explicable by the notion that what we have in humans in chromosome 2 is a fusion based that basically that our common ancestor would have had 48 chromosomes. Chimpanzees continue to have 48 chromosomes to this day, but the human line, having gone its own separate way, at some point along the way had a fusion between these two chromosomes that put them together into what we see as human chromosome 2. Can I, yeah, Cheryl. Now maybe you're going to address this, but sure. Okay, we're we're speaking about uh, similarities in yes. space and time. Yes. Today or last year. Or sure. Last year. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we're all made of the same stuff. Okay. And, yep. And, and you know. Sure. It's got flesh. I've got flesh. A bird's got flesh. Uh, okay. It sounds like you're uh, quoting Paul at this point, but anyway. I, I, well. <laughs> So, okay, then, okay, the, the inference, yep. if I can use the word, is that these similarities suggest a common ancestor. Are you sure. going to get to the natural selection part of this? Or uh, part of we're not going to talk too much about natural selection tonight, but we can certainly cover it in the, uh, in, in the, in discussion. the discussion. Absolutely. Because what, I mean, mm -hmm. the, 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 the similarities are, yep. I mean, we, we could expect that at the cellular level. Yes. I mean, uh, not being a biologist, at the mm -hmm. cellular level, we're all kind of the same. Sure. Uh, but, maybe to your point, we look at each other and we're different. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, the inference to go back, yep. couldn't we make other inferences? inferences? Couldn't we maybe infer that uh, we're close, but we're created different? Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, and and can I take that point from there sure. and, and run with it a bit? It's It's the most common sort of question that comes back. I've already been trying to address that a little bit with the redundancy issue. We could be identical between humans and chimpanzees at the protein level, but have almost completely different DNA sequences at a design level. So even if a designer, or God, if, you know, if we want to talk, you know, ID often, intelligent design often doesn't come out and say it's God, but anyway, okay, God, if God is creating two organisms, it would have been very easy for God to create those two organisms with the identical functional protein components, but yet avoid the appearance of common ancestry by giving those organisms different DNA codes. It would have been very, very easy. But what we see across most of the genome is that when we have an, a functional constraint of a protein, it's encoded at the DNA level by exactly the same code, even though there are millions or billions of different options available for any given gene, every single time for all of our 30,000 some odd genes, it's the exact same DNA sequence, but it doesn't need to be, not from a bio biological perspective. So it goes back to that 98% the same, yep. you only have to be 52 or 52. Right, in that one little snippet, I could have made it, instead of 98, identity, it could have been 53% identity. Yeah. 
Now, the other argument, too, to that point, and it's well worth bringing up, is that there's no design requirement to have genes in a specific spatial order. As we saw with fruit flies, you can get the basic fruit fly biology done with a whole bunch of different gene orders, all sorts of different possibilities. Yet, what we see when we look at humans and chimpanzees is almost exactly the same order. Now, again, if one want, was wanting to avoid the appearance of common ancestry between these two species, it would have been a, quite a simple thing just to mix up the gene orders and have them quite divergent. Yet what we see is same genes, same order in the two different species. So, is that a hamster? Yeah. yeah. It's in the dishwasher. Does that? It's evolving. <laughs> <laughs> so so your, your, your point is a great question. And actually, that's sort of what my... Uh, that one little slide shows there is to say, okay, well, maybe there's some higher order genomic function. We just have to have these genes in this order to get the job done. Doesn't seem to be that way when we look at other species. When we look at the different fruit fly species, many, many different possible orders of, are, are present in those species. It would be easier to argue that divergent fruit fly species are separate creations. It would be much easier to make that argument that they're separately created than humans and chimps. Humans chim and chimps are like this, and those fruit flies are like this. So that's basically the, the idea. Now, of course, the fruit fly, if it was given to theological musing, would have to deal with the issue of why there's all these closely related fruit flies, but, you know, that's another, another issue. Sorry, you'll have to suffer my lame attempts at humor. <laughs> okay. Now that was funny. <laughs> okay. Okay, now, this is sort of piling on, as it were. What else we find when we look in the genome is we find the remnants of genes that are no longer functional, that don't do anything. Sort of genomic archaeology now, if you will. So, if you were walking across a field and came across this, you would readily conclude from your experience that this entity once had a function. No problem. You know what this is for, right? You would also readily conclude that it no longer performs that function at least not its original function. And why is that? Well, it doesn't have a roof anymore. You know what this is for. This is a building. It was intended to have a roof and provide shelter of some nature. It no longer does that function. It's those same lines of inference that we look at in genomic sequences. It's very easy to find a sequence that has the hallmarks of having been a gene. But it's also very easy to find evidence within that sequence that this was once a gene, but it isn't a gene anymore, and it's no longer functional anymore, because it has accumulated a number.